All right, in this video, we're going to discuss rates of change, both average and instantaneous, and we're going to incorporate rates of change with what we call the position function. All right, so what we've been using derivatives so far is to determine the slope at a given point. This is what we call instantaneous rate of change. It is the slope, which is equivalent to rate of change, at a given point. What this means is that we are using the derivative of a function to find the rate of change at a given point. But average rate of change would be the slope or the rate of change between two points. Now, that doesn't require any derivatives at all. For example, if I gave you two points and I said, hey, find the average rate of change between these two points. Well, average rate of change, rate of change, that's slope. Oh, I know how to find the slope between two points. I just take the second y minus the first y on top. And on the bottom, I take the second x minus the first x on the bottom. I mean, it's really easy. Negative 3 minus 5 is negative 8. Negative 11 minus 2 is negative 13. The negatives cancel out. And my slope is 8 over 13. So this would be the average rate of change between these two points. So if I had a function... And here is point one, and here is point two. The average rate of change would be the slope between those two points. So from point one to point two, I clearly have moved down. That's a negative rate of change. And my slope would be, you know, whatever I calculate to be. So if, again, these were the two points, then the average rate of change between the two points would be 8 over 13. That requires zero calculus. That is just old school algebra. Well, if I wanted to find what we call the instantaneous rate of change at a single value, you know, what is the slope at this one point? Now that does require the derivative because that is exactly what the derivative does for us. It finds the rate of change, the slope, at that one single point. So now what we want to do is we want to turn this into motion. A common use for rate of change is to describe the motion of an object moving in a straight line. In such problems, it's customary to use either a horizontal or a vertical line um, to denote that the object's moving. So, you know, we're talking about objects moving in a straight line like this horizontally or objects moving in a vertical line like that. So the function s that gives the position relative to the origin of an object as a function of time t is called a position function. So we write that like this s of t. This is known as the position function. It gives us the position of an object as a function of time t. So basically this is a function where you plug a time t in and you get the position of that object at that time. So as objects move, as objects are put into position, or um, excuse me, as objects are put into motion, over a period of time h, the object changes its position. So then the object's change of position can be modeled by s of t plus h, the position at that time, minus s of t, the position at that time. Now, a picture of this is going to make a lot more sense. So here it is. So what we see here is an object. And this object at this current time t is right here. And um, there is the object, right? And after some time, the object moves and changes its position. And the object is put into motion. And now it's here. Here's my object now. So, you know, t is the time that the object was here. If I allow that object to move for h seconds, it's now moved as a total time of t plus h. t was its beginning time. If I allow it to move for h seconds, it's now t plus h. Now, s is a function that will determine the position at that time. So s of t is the object's position at t seconds. s of t plus h is the position of the object after t plus h seconds. So here we have the time, and here we have the position. To get the position, you need the time. That's what a function is, right? 
So if the question is, hey, this is an object. It moved. It moved from here to here. Huh. What was the object's velocity? What was the object's rate of change? Well, remember, velocity, rate, is distance traveled over time. So all we have to do is figure out the change in distance on top, which is simply S of T plus H minus S of T. Because remember, these are coming from the position function. And the position function gives you the value, the distance at that time. So by subtracting those, you get the change in distance. And in the denominator, you have the change of time. So that would be T plus H minus T. Now the good thing that happens there is the T's cancel. So t plus h minus t is, well, 0, or just h, right? Because the t's cancel make a 0, so you get h. So this right here is how you find the average velocity from point 1 to point 2. Okay, um, hopefully that makes sense, but this picture will have it make a ton of sense. All right, so here we go. We have a billiard ball, a pool ball, right? Uh, maybe the eight ball and I drop it. I drop it from 100 feet in the air. Now, um, after t seconds, the position of that ball will change. And the position function to tell me the position of the ball after t seconds is right here. So how does this function work? You give it a time, it gives you a distance above the ground. Now you would think I would use h for distance above the ground, h for height, but whatever, in, in, in calc we use S. All right, so what we want to do is we want to find the average velocity over the time interval 1 to 1.7 seconds. So if I picture the ball dropping, here is the ball at 1 second, here is the ball at 1.7 seconds. All right, well, I want to find the velocity. I want to find the average velocity. To find the average velocity, I need distance traveled over time. Well, the time's pretty easy. 1.7 minus 1, that equals 0.7. It has traveled for 0.7 seconds. That's easy. But now what I need is I need the uh, distance traveled. So that's where the position function comes in. After one second, if I plug in 1, I get negative 16 times 1 squared plus 100. So after one second, the position equation tells me that my object is 84 feet above the ground. Again, all I had to do was plug in 1. 1 squared is 1. 1 times negative 16 is negative 16 plus 100 is 84 feet. Now, down here, after 1.7 seconds, I will need a calculator for this. Sorry, make fun of me all you want, but I can't do that in my head. So negative 16 times 1.7 squared plus 100 gives me a distance of 53.76 feet. So remember, the ball started 100 feet in the air. After one second, it's now 84 feet above the ground. After 1.7 seconds, it's now 53.76 feet above the ground. So my change would be the 53.76 minus 84. That will be the distance I traveled in between. So 53.76 minus 84 is negative 30.24. Now all I got to do is divide the distance traveled divided by the time. So dividing that by 0 0.7 is negative 43.2 feet per second. And this is the velocity. All that means is that from point 1 to point 2, this ball has had an average velocity of negative 43.2 feet per second. Negative because it's going down, 43.2 feet per second because it's moving. That's average velocity. Oh yeah, by the way, I've done zero calculus in this video thus far. This is nothing more than finding the rate of change, the slope, between two points. All right, here comes the derivative. Here comes the calculus. Instantaneous velocity. Instantaneous velocity is not the average velocity, but it's the exact velocity of an object at any given time. So I'm not asking you what's the average velocity from point one to point two. I'm asking you what is the instantaneous velocity at one single point. And here it is, guys. 
The instantaneous velocity of an object in motion can be found using the derivative of the position function. Oh my God, this is awesome. So here we go. The position function, s of t, tells you your position at time t. The derivative of the position function, s prime of t, is a formula for the velocity at any single time t. So if we go back to this problem, and instead of asking you for the average velocity from point one to point two, if I said right here at this one instance, what is the instantaneous velocity, then I'm going to need the derivative. Well, the derivative of my position function can be easily found with a couple of our simple rules, negative 32t. That is a formula for the velocity. So the velocity at this one instant, one if I you know, pause time, if I drop this ball and I pause time at 1.7 seconds, the velocity at that one moment would be negative 32 times 1.7. It's that easy. Negative 32 times 1.7 is negative 54.4 feet per second. And that is instantaneous velocity. That's calculus. But my goodness, how easy is that? It's just taking the derivative. Very, very simple. All right, let's do one more problem and we'll end this video. All right, at time t equals zero, a diver jumps from a platform diving board that is 32 feet above the water, and the position of the diver, where s is in feet and t is in time, is given by here. This is the function. So if I were to draw a picture of this, right? So I have I have my oh, let me use blue for water. So here's my water, and um, here is the side of the pool, and here is the diver on the platform. And the diver's going to jump into the air and dive into the water. And the position, the height of that diver at any given time can be found using this formula, negative 16t squared plus 16t plus 32. So I have a couple questions here. When does the diver hit the ground, hit the water, hit the water, sorry, hit the water, not diving on the ground? And what is the velocity at impact? So what I want to know is when the diver hits the water at this instant, what is the velocity? How fast is the diver moving when the diver splashes into the ground? Well, to need that, right, to find velocity, all I need is the derivative of my position function. That's going to be negative 32t plus 16. All I did was find the derivative. That is a formula for the velocity at any single time t. Now, the only issue is I need a time t. So how do I get the time t? What I need to figure out is how much time does it take the diver to hit the water? If I could figure out that time, then I could just plug it into my velocity formula. All right, so when a diver hits the water, his height is zero. So what I need to do is solve for what time it takes for the diver to hit the ground. Well, um, let's see here. How can I make this easier? I could factor out a negative 16. I get t squared minus t minus 2. Now, be careful because I had to factor out a negative 16. So that's going to leave behind a negative t and a negative 2. Because if I were to distribute that, I get negative 16t squared, positive 16t, and positive 32. All right, so let's see here. Can I factor this? I hope and pray that I can. Let's see here. t times t is t squared. 2 times 1 is 2. And a negative 2 and a positive 1 will make it happen. So that means t could be 2 seconds or t could be negative 1 second. Now, first and foremost, this is a real world problem. You cannot have negative time in the real world. So I'm just going to ignore that negative option which gives only one answer, two seconds, which means it will take two seconds for the diver to jump and hit the water. So now that I figured out the time it takes to hit the water to find the velocity at impact, all I got to do is plug in two to my derivative and I get negative 32 times two plus 16 and I get negative 48. 
So negative 48 feet per second is the velocity at the instant that the diver hits the water. Guys, how easy is that? I mean, the honestly, the calculus part of this problem is unbelievably easy. The calculus part of the problem is just finding the derivative. That's the velocity equation. Then all you got to do is worry about t. t is the time you're looking for. Well, if I'm looking to hit the water, then I'm looking for how much time it takes to have a height of zero. Height of zero means I hit the water. And then again, figure it out. Um, you know, if I could also say after one second, the diver is somewhere midair. What's the velocity after at, at one second? Well, then all I got to do is plug in one. But instantaneous velocity is the velocity at any one specific instant, not average velocity. Average velocity is the slope rate of change velocity between two points. Well, I'm not doing that anymore. We're talking about a single point. All right, guys, that's it for this video. Hope it was pretty easy and that you enjoyed it. See you on the next video.